what's true and what's not. This is what we're here to talk about. This is what we're <laughs> figuring out here in our podcast. So welcome back to our listeners. Again, I'm Tim Horgan, the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council. And here with me, as always, is Melinda Negron Gonzalez. Howdy, y'all. So, Melinda, how are things going with you? I'm sure the semester is treating you well. It is. It is. I think we all have Zoom fatigue. However, I will say that. But yep. otherwise, things are going very well at UNH. Good. Yeah, I think on Thursday, I have hour-long meetings from 11 until 5, all on Zoom. It's going to be a fun day. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have 9 to 4 this Friday, Zoom. Nice, nice. Well, at least it's only until 4. You can get out an hour early. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Anyway, I'm happy that you're, you're here to chat about the, the big issues in the world. And of course, one of those that we've decided to talk about in our, as you mentioned last time, ever so positive and uplifting podcast, what is going on in Armenia and Azerbaijan? You figure in the, what, 30 years since the fall of the Soviet Union, they could have maybe figured this out. But yeah, that's how... Oh. Uh, you know. that's, that's how international relations goes, I guess. We, we got to keep things exciting, got to keep people on their toes. You know, I had been thinking for the past several years that are we ever really going to see another like major battle between two countries or is it always going to be sort of this asymmetric warfare that, you know, you have terrorist groups or splinter cells doing things. But yeah, we've got a, a full-blown, not yet declared war, but armed conflict, I guess we'll go with. I was reading before we got started here about the history of this conflict. What do you know about that? Yes, interstate warfare is back, apparently. And this was a frozen conflict. So, I mean, there are all kinds of border disputes, right, around the world that just kind of freeze and are never fully resolved. And then all of a sudden, decades later, there's another flare up. And so we see that happening here. And the backstory for the armed conflict is back to the 1920s, if we want to start there. That's a good starting point, I suppose. And basically, the complex history in 30 seconds or less <laughs> is that the Soviets set up Nagorno-Karabakh as an autonomous region within Azerbaijan, which was one of the Soviet Socialist Republics in the USSR. And the problem was, of course, that an overwhelming majority of people there in that region were and are Armenian. So the Soviet Union, of course, a totalitarian state, so that helped to keep that conflict from really escalating into anything major. And then, of course, as the Soviet Union is beginning to collapse in on itself in the late 80s, the flare-up starts again, and by 1991, when the Soviet Union dissolves itself, the region basically descends into all-out war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And long story short, by 1993, Armenia, which is the smaller of the two countries, controls Nagorno-Karabakh and then occupies an additional area around that territory, much to the chagrin of the Azeris. And so by 94, Russia brokers a ceasefire and then the conflict is never resolved, of course, because that's not how it works in these types of situations. It just gets stuck in this never, never land of let's kick this can down the road for a few decades and dot, dot, dot. There's a flare up in 2016, but then there's another ceasefire brokered by Russia and company. And then in July of this year, there were skirmishes and it it escalated into a full-blown armed conflict in late September. And basically you have Armenia claiming Nagorno-Karabakh controlling it and Azerbaijan very angry about this and wanting to challenge their control. And so by now there's been a high number of casualties, lots of internally displaced people, sad. All the good stuff yeah. that, you know, 2020. Exactly. And so there was a ceasefire agreed to on Saturday. Well, that broke down shortly thereafter. 
Yeah, so it, it seems like, you know, Russia is becoming worse and worse at negotiating ceasefires is, is my takeaway from this. You know, the first one lasted about 10 or so years. The second one, a few more, a few less, depending on how you decipher it all. But now this latest one, like five, 10 minutes, maybe, <laughs> I think is, is how long it lasted before both sides were saying that the other side had breached the ceasefire. And one of the really interesting things, I think, to note about this conflict is that it's been for a long time uh, couched in the Christian Muslim nature of both these countries and that, you know, Armenian citizens or people of ethnic Armenian background shouldn't have to live under the control of the Azerbaijanis. And so, you know, that plays a role in this. And then also conveniently, Earlier this year, the new president of Armenia was kind of having some trouble at home. He wasn't delivering on his promises and his political clout was falling. And if anyone has seen the old, I think, 1980s movie, Wag the Dog, or Canadian Bacon, even better example, let's just create a conflict and go from there and see see what happens. Anyone who hasn't seen Canadian Bacon? No, I that would be me. Oh, it's a good movie. John Candy, Alan Alda from MASH. He's the president. Nice. He wants a war because <laughs> his poll numbers are dropping and the Russians refuse to restart the Cold War because they love America now. <laughs> and so they, they decide to create this fake war with Canada that people from Canada are infiltrating the US and we can't even tell them apart from who we are. Well, they've been doing that forever. I was, as, I know. as everyone knows, I mean, Canada is exactly. security threat number one to the U.S. Exactly. And so then, you know, you have John Candy and his ragtag bunch of police officers and whatnot in Buffalo, New York, protecting the border, infiltrating into Canada and throwing trash everywhere because that's like the biggest, most offensive thing you can do to Canada and all that good stuff. Highly recommend watching that movie. All Just right. all sorts of great things about international relations in there. Um, but right. after that entirely unserious <laughs> divergence in this serious and not fun podcast, yes, um, we, we're back to Armenia and Azerbaijan. So you have this president who is having issues with his poll numbers, with his support, and surprise, surprise, he looks next door and says, huh. Let's start something over there and really became very nationalistic in, in his rhetoric and in his speeches. And so unfortunately, as you mentioned, hundreds of people are now dead over this conflict that really, you know, again, had been pretty much frozen, obviously not resolved, but at least people weren't dying over this. And there were conversations. You had the Madrid Accords in 2009 that really laid out a framework for the Peace negotiations, obviously, they never completed those peace negotiations, but the opportunities had been there. And I think people kind of lost sight that this was a problem that we needed to be focused on. And here we are now. Indeed, here we are. And, you know, at some point, hopefully, there will be a ceasefire that sticks. But it's all about a durable peace once and for all. And it seems that a lot of Russia experts are, you know, focusing on Russia's sort of weak response, at least initially, whereas in the past, Russia had quickly intervened to bring about a ceasefire before things really escalated into full-blown war. It didn't do so this time around. And so people are wondering about you know, why Russia is prevaricating and what, you know, what's the game plan here? And is Putin sort of trying to, you know, let the Armenians suffer just a little because the new leader is not as pro-Russian as the previous guy. And so maybe he just needs a lesson in how much Armenia is dependent on Russia and, and they want them to beg. I don't know. I'm not a Russia expert. But what I do know is that when there seems to be a lack of will on either side to really bring about a durable peace, and that's what I'm getting from the statements that are made by leaders in both countries, there can be perhaps some temporary mechanisms by which you know each country dis agrees to continue the conversation and at least stop fighting for a while and then maybe those talks don't go anywhere and you have a frozen conflict once again 
because I don't think that this is going to be resolved anytime soon. Well, and we can't, yeah, we can't forget one of our other favorite authoritarian leaders in this conflict, Mr. <laughs> Erdogan and his role that, that? he's playing. Yeah, never heard of that, that guy. guy. Yeah, I mean, you throw Turkey into the mix here, which with the full geopolitical ramifications of that being so interesting in how Erdogan had been cozying up to Putin. They bought the S-400 missile system that the U.S. really didn't want them to buy and actually launched a couple of those most likely last week. And yet you have this initial shift towards Russia from Turkey, and now they find themselves on the opposite side of this conflict. And really, there have been some verbal shots fired between those two countries. And I think it's really interesting how that's playing out as well. And again, got to love how different countries get involved and sort of make things worse. And I would include the U.S. in that. But also the U.S. has a role to play in situations like this to try and bring about a peaceful resolution through negotiations trying to make sure that that both sides see the light of sticking to a ceasefire, but would be so interested if we could play out those simulations, we'll call it, of what would happen if these two countries were just allowed to talk to each other and no one else was involved and see where things go from there. Yes, perhaps assuming that they were allowed to just talk to each other. and Because at the end of the day, Azerbaijan has the upper hand militarily. So let's say the Russians were not going to intervene on behalf of the Armenians. That just gives the Azerbaijanis a green light to go in and do what they will do because they're wealthier, they are stronger militarily speaking, and even if they didn't have the backing of the Turks, so long as the Russians were not interested in intervening, poor Armenia is lost out there on its own. Right. Yeah, I was also reading recently that because Armenia has been the initial provocateur in this, I'm not absolving Azerbaijan of their role in this either, but Armenia has stepped away from the Madrid Accords. They've said, we're not going to follow that peace plan anymore. They unilaterally did that. So now some experts are saying, well, actually, that gives Azerbaijan perfect cover to say, okay, fine, we're not doing this anymore. Well, we're bigger, we're stronger, we're coming after you. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out over the next couple of weeks and hopefully is resolved sooner rather than later. Hopefully. And, and, you know, do pay attention to this Twitter feed of Kim Kardashian West. Not. (laughs) I am kidding. Don't do that. Yeah. There was an article about how celebrities are making this conflict worse. And I clicked on it for a second and then was like, no, I can't. I can't read this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually kind of a nice segue into our next topic. We've got Russia still. We've got social media. And, you know, the, the third thing to add in there to make things fun and exciting is the election. What are you hearing about Russia's interference? And I'll give a little background into China interference. Well, it ain't good, right? Just as a recap, in case you missed it, (laughs) you know, 2016 election in the United States, the Russians interfered. They had a multi-pronged strategy. They, you know, had the social media influence and infiltration campaign. They also had a cyber hacking operation. And then, of course, they tried to infiltrate the operation of the Trump campaign. Okay, so multi-pronged strategy and the social media influence campaign, of course, was trying to sow discord, right? And so they set up these fake accounts and some of these fake groups, United Muslims of America, et cetera, even had protests that were scheduled, fake protests. And so they were just basically trying to exacerbate the divisions that we have in the U.S. during this time of extreme polarization. They're doing the same thing, right? They're doing the same thing. They've added some new techniques to the playbook. And so now in 2020, they're doing some of the same things, but they're also attempting to impersonate some real political candidates. And so they had this Bernie campaign where they tried to pretend that this Twitter account was actually Bernie Sanders. And it was there to basically, you know, foster confusion at best and discord at worst. And so they're getting a little bit more 
creative in what they do. And they've got these troll farms. Allegedly, they now have these troll farms in Ghana and Nigeria that are doing a lot of the work in the 2020 election. They also have created these fake news or fake data websites. There was something called Peace Data, which, you know, set up this nonprofit news portal for progressives and they had AI generated avatars as the editor. So, you know, here's this editor, you know, his name is John Smith or something very, very, you know, (laughs) typical American name. And he had a photograph and it was an AI generated avatar. And so the site itself was being run by the Russians, but they were soliciting pieces by legitimate (laughs) scholars and journalists around the world who were basically sending in their stuff only to find months later that they were submitting legitimate articles sometimes to a fake organization that was set up by the Russians. And so they're engaged in all kinds of shady stuff like that as well. And the thing is, that is most tragic to me, we got so much information over the last several years about Russia's interference in 2016 and 2018, that it's sad to see that they can continue to spread disinformation, misinformation, so discord, et cetera. It's like, haven't we learned anything in the past few years? What's up with us, America? Well, one of the things that really sticks out for me when I was doing some background research on this is the point that they have it easy. They don't need to create all of this content and and make it up and have it, you know, sound real, they can just take what's already on the internet and just promote it out there. There are enough people with crazy conspiracy theories, the QAnons and the whatever else is out there. I try to avoid it as much as possible. Imagine that. But, you know, you just go on these websites, these fringe websites and social media areas, and you build up a following and then you just retweet stuff and and people eat it up because... People just, you know, want to believe what they want to believe. And if it's written on the internet, it must be true, right? It must be true. (laughs) And guess who they're trying to help? Guess who the Russians are trying to help this election cycle? Uh, I I have no idea. I I don't know. I I, (laughs) Donald Trump, is that his name? Yes. Yes. So once again, their preferred candidate is... Donald Trump. So they are actively trying to promote, you know, all kinds of controversies about Biden. It is interesting that one of the big things about this is what does Russia get from it? Donald Trump has not necessarily been, he's tried to cozy up to Russia, but the sanctions that have been placed on Russia have been pretty stiff. So what do they get from this? And in my humble opinion, it's that they are just looking to create as much controversy and so as much discord in the US as they can. And they view Donald Trump as the person who best fits that goal. And Biden, sure, there are people out there who dislike Biden, who who may not feel that he is their candidate, but he's not out there making some of the more interesting comments that our president makes or tweets or whatever his medium of choices for the day. And so I think they may not like him personally as a candidate. They may not think that, you know, he's going to be overly nice to Russia, but I think they view him as someone who fits their overall goal of sowing discord and creating problems for the U.S. because Russia, in all honesty, doesn't have the opportunity to do anything else. I mean, they can't compete with the U.S. economy. They can't compete with the U.S. military, although they continually try to do their flybys and all that kind of stuff. But really, this is where they are at. This is what they can do. And it's a pretty crude, unsophisticated sort of way of doing this because they're using these channels that are already available to them. They haven't created anything new like the Chinese. Perfect transition. Oh, okay. Nice transition. <laughs> yeah, well you done. see where that Although was. It's going. worth saying, it's worth mentioning that, you know, I mean, the Russians have been doing this for a long time. They did this during the Cold War, right. too. And then there was a pause in the 90s and early 2000s. Now they're back. But so I know way less about China's influence operations and how far back those go. So and, and, please and do the, enlighten me. 
the scary thing is, is that it seems like the intelligence community knows less about what China is doing than what the Russians are doing. Again, because yeah. the Chinese are much wealthier, much more sophisticated. They have economic market share that they can use to bully people around, as we saw with the NBA when the Houston Rockets owner made comments in support of Hong Kong's protests, and then the NBA was basically banned from China for a little while. So it's much more sophisticated and much harder to decipher exactly when they're doing these things and how they're doing these things. Many of them include blackmail. Many of them include just economic bullying, basically. See what they do around the world in regards to the Belt and Road Initiative and how they've tie different support to different countries who then, surprise, surprise, disavow any connection to Taiwan. So in terms of actual election disinformation interference, there is some evidence that that is going on. From my understanding, it is not to the level of what the Russians are doing in terms of their disinformation campaigns, but that doesn't make it any less nefarious or problematic. And one thing that you sort of see in politics today, surprise, surprise, you have the Republicans saying, oh, well, China is, is much scarier than Russia because China is, quote unquote, supporting Biden because they don't like Trump and all of his trade war stuff and other things. So you end up with the Democrats then, of course, saying that Russia is much worse and trying to make these comparisons. I think we run into the issue of signaling to these countries that, oh, you are better or worse than what the other group is. So as long as you keep doing what you're doing, we're okay. But what we really need to be signaling is all of this is bad. We can't have this stuff happening and it needs to stop. So in terms of really what China has been up to, they have been doing some social media disinformation campaigns. Facebook recently announced that they took down a number of sites and pages that were coming from China. They didn't necessarily tie it directly to the Chinese Communist Party, but you imagine that pretty much whatever happens in China is basically sanctioned by the Chinese government. But really what they are more interested in doing is not sowing discord because the Chinese play the long game. They've been around as a world power for about 5,000 years or whatever the exact number is. And so you end up with them looking at things in a much longer time frame, And so what they are looking to do is actually compete with the US and gain influence and power throughout the world. And most of what their propaganda and their disinformation centers around are things that their interests are lying in. So they put together a video, digital video, it was like two minutes long, and you had these Lego-like creatures, people, I guess, you had the Statue of Liberty, and then like, EMTs, but one of them was holding a bow and arrow. I'm not entirely sure why. And they were talking about how the coronavirus pandemic, you know, the US was responding to it and claiming all these terrible things about China and China was doing all the great things. You know, yeah, we, we had some problems in the beginning, but we're, we're good now. And I watched the video and I was like, huh, actually, I can see how that works and, and how someone who just watches this thinks, oh, that was really cute. And yeah, it must be true. But if where you really- did you, Where did you find the video on YouTube? Yeah, I'll, I'll, send, I'll send you the link and we'll put it in the description of today's podcast, but nice. cautioning that, you know, this did come from the Chinese government and so- <laughs> Buyer beware, basically. But it's more about South China Sea. It's more about Chinese military supremacy and that the coronavirus, well, yeah, maybe it came from China. It's not our fault, basically. All right. I look forward to looking at that video. <laughs> At the end of the day, whether it's Russia or China or Iran, because I've also read that Iran is doing some things as well, and clearly they don't have as many resources as the Russians or the Chinese. But you know, at the end of the day, I think that for the moment, people around the world have really found our Achilles heel. <laughs> we are our own worst enemies at the moment, and uh, the internet. The internet is a gift and a curse to democracy. And so not only does it tarnish America's image abroad as a stable and strong democracy, adding to the polarization simply makes foreign policy and domestic policy get stuck in these culture wars and all of this polarized rhetoric. And so it makes the U.S. a less effective actor internally and globally 
And I mean, that's sort of the point of Russia's and China's influence operations is to basically, you know, make the U.S. less able to do what it wants to do around the world and to undermine faith in American institutions at home. And so far, that seems to be <laughs> going well for them. Doing and a that, good job. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of Iran, real quick story, because this was just really funny. One of the disinformation campaigns that they did was setting up a Black Lives Matter Facebook group that was talking about Black Lives Matter using terminology like all lives matter. So they clearly did not read up on the difference there. They were also then talking about like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, U.S. foreign policy, and just like all of the top hits of what Iran wanted in one Facebook group. And everyone was like, yep, okay, this is Iran. We're going to shut this down. But just that they got a, a ways to go before they can really uh, play on the, the big boy stage, it sounds like. Oh, dear. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that will bring us to time, unless, of course, you want to take this week's challenge. Which is to... <laughs> Uh, your students were supposed to research a good news story for you. Well, I forgot to ask them. So, uh, <laughs> but well, my good news story for the day is that it's warm and sunny there we in go. mid-October. But I also read something recently about Portugal and bicycles. There you go. Two things that I love, Portugal and bicycles. So apparently bicycle manufacturing is a big thing in Portugal. And initially because of the pandemic, a lot of the factories had to stop operations and were losing money, et cetera. But because of the pandemic and because people are afraid to take public transportation in Europe, they have been buying bicycles left and right, which by the way, is better for the air and the environment. So now bicycle manufacturing is off the charts in Portugal and they can barely meet demand. That is a good news story. There you Tim. go. There we go. I like that. Yeah. And Denmark is on pace to become carbon neutral very soon. So that's another positive with all their bicycle riding. I didn't think you could actually get more bicycles in Denmark, but apparently they have been. So watch out cars in, in Denmark. Well, thank you, Melinda, for joining me today. Thank you. I really appreciate your time and your insights. It's always fun talking with you about our super fun and exciting international news. So until next time, we will chat again. Be safe, y'all. Thank you for joining us for this latest episode of the Global and the Granite State podcast, a program of the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire. We hope you enjoyed our discussion and learned something new. Please don't forget to rate our podcast and leave us a comment. We would love to hear from you about what topics you would be most interested in. Our producer, editor, audio technician, and host is Tim Horgan. Our theme music is Admin by A.A. Alto. Until next time.